While Bruce McLaren and Denny Holm had had to progress through the minor formulas, the young Chris Amon went straight to Formula One. I was uh, what, 19 when I first went over there and I, I guess I was felt a bit like a fish well out of water for a, for a while. No, the first Formula One race he saw, he was driving in, which is pretty remarkable. I uh, arrived on Good Friday evening, had a fitting in the, um, fitting in the car and practised at Goodwood um, next morning, um, on the Saturday morning. Um, and raced on the um, Easter Monday. <laughs> Chris's entry to Formula One had seemed easy, but his luck was about to change. Reg Parnell died within months of Chris being over there, uh, so he'd missed going into the 64 season. But with his death, uh, the relationship with the engine makers, with the chassis makers, dropped, and Chris was running for uh, Reg's son, Tim. I think Tim had sort of bought the gears third hand. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I mean, he, he was lacking in budget. Bruce McLaren had meantime got back to ten. And budget was also becoming a problem for Bruce McLaren. In the 1950s, Coopers had led the change from front to rear engine cars. But by the early 60s, they were reluctant to invest in further development. The cars were becoming less competitive. So he decided to go out on his own and give it a whirl, such as Jack had done. Jack Brabham, this year a Lotus private entry. He wanted to work in development and working within the confines of someone else, you always have to convince the boss of your ideas, whereas being more entrepreneurial perhaps from the New Zealand point of view and the difference in work styles perhaps, he felt that he could probably achieve more on his own. Bruce McLaren wisely brings the Cooper in for a check, falling to 11th place. Bruce continued driving for Coopers, but in 1964 set up his own workshop. He was in an awful uh, trading estate and sort of big puddles outside the door and mud. and you know, It was very, very basic. Coopers refused to send a car out for the 1964 Tasman series, but Bruce was determined to go. He built two of his own Coopers to be driven by himself and his friend Timmy Mayer. That series saw neck and neck battles between the Brabhams and the McLarens, but Bruce eventually took the series. The source of greatest pride for him was to win the New Zealand Grand Prix in his own car. But the season ended tragically. At the final round in Tasmania, Timmy Mayer's car became airborne and struck a tree, killing him instantly. Bruce was devastated um, that somebody he had a great admiration for um, was actually killed in one of Bruce's cars. Timmy's death in 64 there must have been a tremendous shock because Timmy was part of the first team, shall we say, that Bruce was in, involved with on his own, although he was still working for Coopers as well at the time. It was one of the hardest things for him to accept. Uh, and that's when he wrote that, those words about to me. To do something well is so worthwhile that to die trying to do it better cannot be foolhardy. It would be a waste of life to do nothing with one's ability, for I feel that life is measured in achievement, not in years alone. I guess it's like any sportsman today. They they know the danger is there and it is part of the job that they accept. So Bruce's words to sort of to do something well is so worthwhile, say it all and they just accepted it. But little did he know that he was writing his own epitaph. In 1965, Bruce had new responsibilities with the birth of his daughter, Amanda. My mother has a, a great newspaper article from one of the British papers with me as about a two or three year old standing beside one of my dad's cars saying big noise, big noise. So I was at races but I, I don't remember him. Amanda, come on darling. How far do you allow yourself to be conscious of the risks that he's running when he's racing? I don't really think about them. I'm not a nervous type fortunately and I don't really think about things that can happen. I mean, I, one always knows they can, and I don't think you completely dismiss them from your mind, but on the other hand, if you keep yourself busy as I do, you have got time to think about them anyway, which I think is the best way. Something assembled in a hurry, 
uh, perhaps not crack checked or not um, not assembled absolutely perfect uh, can be uh, can be very dangerous. The growing McLaren team moved to larger premises at Colnbrook, where they would remain for 14 years. Here, Bruce had room to pursue many projects. One of his preoccupations had been the development of a serious sports car. Bruce was testing it at Goodwood, and they had a, a hinged flap in the nose to get at the oil cap. And somebody had forgotten to put the Zeus fastener right down, and he'd noticed that it was flapping. Uh, and as he got out onto the straight, he just assumed the thing was the wind force would hold this flap down. But to his surprise, the flap was standing right up against the wind. And so he's thinking, now why is it doing that? And then he realised that the force of the wind pressure coming through the nose of the car was greater than the force of the airstream over it. So he, kept, he came straight into the pits and he got the guys to get the tin snips and they cut a hole, cut, effectively cut the flap out and he just had this big hole in the nose of the car. And all of a sudden, the handling of high-speed handling of the car was transformed. And so that was the uh, McLaren had pioneered the hole in the nose thing. They were the first to do that. Those first McLaren sports cars met with immediate success in America. This didn't go unnoticed by the giants of the car industry. In the early 60s, Bruce had had considerable experience at Le Mans, where Ferrari had dominated the prestigious 24-hour race. So when Henry Ford II wanted to break that stranglehold, Bruce was recruited to develop the GT40s. And to drive them, Bruce suggested Denny and Chris. 